Hello, everyone. Welcome. I'm Stephanie Jordan. I'm the local food program manager at Sustainable Solano. Welcome. This is the Solano Local Food System Alliance quarterly meeting for the month of May. And um, as I mentioned, I'm with Sustainable Solano. We are a nonprofit organization that works throughout Solano County doing work in green infrastructure, local food, and also resiliency. Solano County is in the unceded territory of California, which is home to nearly 200 tribal nations. And on behalf of Sustainable Solano, I want to acknowledge and honor the indigenous people who have inhabited and stewarded this land for generations. I invite you to take a look at a native land map, which my colleague Allison will be posting in the chat, so you can learn more about where you live. Um, so at these Alliance meetings, we dive into a number of topics that intersect with the local food system. Today, it is all about the Farm Bill, as you guys know. Um, and Allison, if you could go ahead and also post our agenda in the chat. That will kind of give us the roadmap for the day or the afternoon. It might be evening for some of you. Um, so first, we are going to receive some background about the Farm Bill, what it is, what's included, some hot topics, and then we will move into how we can interact with that bill, whether it's as an individual or perhaps as an organization. And so as we go along, you're welcome to post some questions in the chat. Um, also, I recommend using speaker view just to kind of help clean up your screen a little bit. Um, also, this meeting is being recorded, and so if you would like to share it out, we will be posting it to our website within the next week or two after this event. Um, so we chose this topic because the Solano Local Food System Alliance is just kind of at the beginning stages of creating a framework for advocacy. So we're in kind of the, when I say we, because Sustainable Solano is a member of the Alliance, along with a number of other stakeholders around the county, um, there is kind of some potential time and space for this group to be more active in policy work. So, you know, we thought we'd start with something really simple and easy, like the Farm Bill. Ha ha. You know, it's this giant piece of legislation. <laughs> so we're going to just learn a lot more about that today. And helping us through this are two fantastic guest speakers with me today. Um, first, I would like to welcome Christina. Better Echo. She works as a healthcare consultant at Avalier Health, where her focus is on evidence generation, quality measurement, and elevating the role of nutrition in healthcare. She also regularly writes, teaches, and presents about nutrition, healthy cooking, and sustainable agriculture, including publishing a book, The Farm Bill, A Citizen's Guide, in 2019. Christina previously worked for the EPA, Teaching Kitchen Collaborative, Oakland Unified School District, NIH Clinical Center and other organizations. She serves on the board for Slow Food DC, the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics Farm Bill Task Force, the Teaching Kitchen Collaboratives Nutrition Working Group, and other organizations. She earned her Master's of Public Health from UC Berkeley and her Bachelor's Degree in Ecology and Evolutionary Biology from Princeton. Um, and she also completed her dietetic internship at Massachusetts General Hospital. So Christina is joining us from Washington, DC. So she's kind of out there in the thick of it all. And uh, also joining us, who is fresh off a plane from Washington, DC, is Sakina Chavez. And Sakina earned her bachelor's degree in philosophy from Georgetown University and a master's of public policy from the Goldman School at UC Berkeley. While in the District of Columbia, Sakina was deeply involved in anti-hunger and anti-poverty research and advocacy with DC Hunger Solutions and the Congressional Hunger Center, where she was a 23rd class Emerson National Hunger Fellow. And while pursuing her MPP degree, Sakina has completed graduate internships with the California Legislative Analyst Office and the San Francisco Human Services Agency. So welcome to both of you. We are super excited to have you and your expertise with us today. Um, I think I'm just gonna turn it right over to Christina, who's gonna start with kind of a broad overview and um, give us kind of the, the big brush strokes. So go ahead, Christina. All right, thank you. Um, one moment, I'll pull up my slides. Okay, are you seeing my first slide? All right, looks good. 
Okay, great. Let me um, go ahead and play so I can see the notes. Okay, great. So thank you all so much for having us this evening. Um, Sakina and I are uh, very pleased to be able to meet you all and talk with you all. Um, so I, as you just heard, I'm going to get us started today with a little bit of an overview um, before handing it over to Sakina. Um, so start off with a little bit about the structure and history of the Farm Bill and an overview of some of the far reaching effects um, on different aspects of the environment, health, um, trade, etc. Um, talk about a few examples of recent issues that um, I guess I wrote likely to affect the Farm Bill um, are, are already affecting the Farm Bill because um, these are issues we're hearing debated um, as the House and the Senate are already working on their versions of the bill. Um, I'll spend just a few extra minutes talking about um, nutrition and SNAP, um, given that uh, as a dietitian and healthcare provider, that's often um, uh, focused backing up a bit. So we talked a little bit uh, very briefly about how farm bills are passed and funded. I talked about the uh, reauthorization every five to seven years and then mentioned that there are certain programs that are uh, appropriated um, uh, each year. So they are uh, uh, considered discretionary. Um, and so not all programs that are authorized through the Farm Bill to receive a certain amount of funding will actually receive that amount. They may be subject to the annual appropriations process. Okay, so then on this title, uh, excuse me, on this slide, I wanted to show um, visually that uh, how the Farm Bill spends the dollar. So if we imagine all of the funding in the Farm Bill presented uh, in a $1 bill, um, we can see that the top four um, titles make up roughly 99% of the spending. Um, when I use the word title, by the way, that sort of means like a category of program. So the different programs in the Farm Bill are uh, categorized into titles. So the four biggest ones, um, as far as spending goes, are nutrition, crop insurance, conservation, and commodities. And then there are another eight titles that all together make up just about 1% of spending. And um, just in case there's any confusion, the order that you see on the right-hand side, um, those are not listed in order of um, uh, dollar amount. Those are the order in which they appear um, in the Farm Bill itself. So another way to visualize um, spending by the Farm Bill um, that can be helpful is looking over time. And so this graph um, I took from the Congressional Research Service. Um, which is a great source of information about um, the Farm Bill and um, other pieces of legislation and, and federal spending. So looking uh, back roughly about 30 years, um, we can see a, a couple of points um, I'll call out uh, regarding spending on these top four titles in the Farm Bill. So um, first, nutrition is the um, gray bars that we see um, and in the last couple of decades in particular, we can see that nutrition makes up uh, by far the largest chunk of the Farm Bill. And there have been a, a couple of points in time when um, it has increased in particular. So one of those was, um, I guess, just about 15 years ago, 2008, 2009, coming out of the Great Recession. Um, and then also just in the last couple of years, SNAP spending has increased um, substantially again. Um, for a few different reasons, a couple of them being um, revisions of uh, the thrifty food plan. So that's the way in which um, the amount that SNAP uh, participants, the amount of dollars that SNAP participants receive is determined um, based on this, this thrifty food plan. Um, and then also uh, increase in need and demand during the pandemic. Um, and other issues that have led to an increase in um, food insecurity and issues with food access in the United States. Uh, and then one, one other point um, I'll call out uh, based on this graph uh, is looking at the, uh, excuse me, the red and blue bars. So we see blue, uh, which represents the crop insurance programs, and then red, which represents the commodity uh, programs. 
Uh, and over time, over these few decades, we've seen crop insurance grow a bit and that's expected to actually continue to increase um, and actually kind of overshadow or take on a greater importance um, in the way we support and subsidize um, agriculture in the US as compared to the commodity programs um, that uh, help to essentially boost uh, prices and revenue for farmers. Um, so yes, and, and as I said, we expect the sort of in continued um, increase in, in that importance of the crop insurance programs going forward. Um, so this pie chart, uh, one other visualization of um, the breakdown in spending, like I mentioned before, and um, this is projected spending in particular for the 2018 Farm Bill. At the time it was passed, um, nutrition estimated to account for about um, just over three quarters of spending in the Farm Bill, um, as I mentioned before. Okay. Um, and so then on this slide, I'm not going to spend too much time, but just wanted to give a little bit more detail about what is included in some of these uh, farm bills, uh, excuse me, titles. Um, so you have an idea of some of these programs that are included. So um, the nutrition title or title number four, um, the uh, by far the largest program is the SNAP program or supplemental nutrition assistance. Um, there are also a variety of other programs in this title. Um, the Emergency Food Assistance Program, TFAP, Senior Farmers Market Nutrition Program, um, the Gus Schumacher Nutrition Incentive Program, also known as GUSNIP, um, and others as well. And generally speaking, these are a variety of nutrition assistance programs to help um, uh, support access to food for Americans who are um, uh, low income and may be experiencing food insecurity. Um, and then we have the crop insurance title. So that includes a variety of programs um, that are meant to help farmers manage risk. Um, and so this includes several programs, as I said, um, by and large, this uh, covers implementation of the federal crop insurance program. We also see the stacked income protection plan, supplemental coverage option, um, and another program I'll come back to briefly later on, the whole farm revenue protection program. Um, and so that is one of these insurance options that uh, is intended for um, farms that are uh, in, uh, growing multiple um, types of crops and perhaps ha are, are um, uh, having other outputs. So might be engaged in diversified agriculture as opposed to um, perhaps just one or two um, commodities. So then we have the commodity title. Um, and so when I use the term commodity, by the way, um, that includes the uh, crops that we are growing um, that are typically grown in very large quantity, um, are often used for a variety of purposes, um, may or may not be used for food, um, are often used in trade. Um, and so that includes things like corn and soy, wheat, peanuts, rice, et cetera. Um, and so some of the programs in this title include price loss coverage, agricultural risk coverage, um, and uh, so really helping to, uh, again, help boost revenue and prices for farmers. And then the fourth largest, uh, fourth large, um, excuse me, the last of the four largest titles is the conservation title. Um, and so the Generally speaking, there are two primary sort of categories of programs um, included in this title. One being the uh, group of programs that support conservation practices on working lands. Um, so land that is being actively used for farming. Um, so the Environmental Quality Incentives Program or EQIP is one example of those. Um, and then the other type um, of program is uh, a sort of a set aside program. So one in which farmers are incentivized to set their land aside, not be actively farming it, um, allow nutrients to regenerate, et cetera. And then on this slide, I'm showing uh, just a couple more details about the remaining eight titles included in the farm bill. Um, and uh, we'll try to breeze through just a few of these um, 
before moving on. So this includes our trade title, um, which supports export programs and also some aspects of international food aid. Um, we have the credit title, world development, research, um, forestry, energy. So that includes things like um, uh, biofuels, which um, at this time in the US is still predominantly corn-based biofuels, um, also solar energy and some other forms of energy production um, on farm. Um, the horticulture title, uh, I'll call out uh, for, for just a minute here, um, because this is a title that includes things like grants for uh, what are called specialty crops. So that's the USDA term for things like fruits and vegetables and nuts and legumes, the types of foods that I think most of us on this call probably think should fill the biggest chunk of people's plates. Um, and then also support for organic agriculture. So uh, things like um, cost sharing assistance for um, uh, farmers to um, transition to organic production. Uh, and then there's a miscellaneous title. So that includes things like um, a support for livestock producers and then also um, beginning disadvantaged and veteran farmers. And I'll talk more in a minute about why that's important. Okay. Um, and then on this slide, oh, you're not going to see my animation, but that's okay. So I wanted to show uh, visually a little bit of a timeline of the farm bills that have been um, passed in the past. So uh, and just to clarify, when I say farm bill, each of these is considered a farm bill. So we reauthorize the farm bill again, roughly every five to seven years. Each one gets its own name. Um, and so uh, in 20... Um, uh, excuse me, 1933, I'll just move this out of the way. Um, the first farm bill was called the Agricultural Adjustment Act of 1933, um, passed in a time in history when we were coming out of the Dust Bowl, the Great Depression. Um, and then in 2018, the most recent one that uh, uh, was signed in 2018 was called the Agriculture Improvement Act. Um, and then uh, just with the white, text boxes here, um, I just overlaid a few examples, um, not exhausted by any means, but a few examples of some um, prominent changes that have occurred over time um, in these historical farm bills. So one example in the 1970s, um, food stamps are made a permanent part of the farm bill. Um, food stamps, again, which have been renamed um, Supplemental Nutrition Assistance or SNAP. Um, we had a conservation title um, that was added in the 80s. Um, we had uh, SNAP ed requirements added in the early 2000s. Uh, and then in 2014, we had the beginnings of um, nutrition incentives and also support for beginning um, and disadvantaged farmers in the Farm Bill. Okay, uh, and then I wanted to give some examples. Again, this is not an exhaustive list of some changes that occurred in uh, the 2018 Farm Bill. Um, and so just to mention a few, uh, looking at the second bullet, so hemp production uh, was actually legalized through this farm bill um, in, in the United States specifically. Um, there were a couple of programs that were made permanent, uh, meaning they'll be included in future farm bills. So um, this farmer opportunities, excuse me, farming opportunities, training and outreach. So um, again, support for um, engaging more people in farming and agriculture, and also the local agriculture marketing program, um, helping really to support um, um, marketing and sales for um, small family farms, local farms, etc. Um, there were some small improvements to that whole farm revenue protection program that I mentioned before um, as, a, as a form of insurance. Um, increased funding for SNAP employment and training opportunities. Um, the Nutrition Incentive Program, or the, the FINI Food and Security Nutrition Incentive Program, received permanent funding um, beginning in 2018. Uh, it was renamed GUSNIP, that Gus Schumacher Nutrition Incentive Program. And uh, another exciting um, addition, uh, or rather, I guess, sort of specific aspect of that is that there was a uh, $25 million that were um, allocated toward pilot uh, programs for nutrition prescription. So um, one of the first examples I really know of that kind of linked 
uh, health care to the farm bill. So healthcare providers are able to, in these pilot programs throughout the U.S., um, write prescriptions for uh, healthy food for the patients. And that's not just based on uh, food insecurity or low income status, but also reflects need based on uh, risk for or uh, diagnosis with a diet related disease. Um, we saw increased funding for organic research and cost sharing, um, but as sort of a downside, reduced restrictions on chemicals that could be used in organic agriculture, um, redesign of that um, dairy margin coverage program to provide more support to dairy farmers in the United States. Um, and then a uh, big expansion in the definition of which family members are considered eligible to receive commodity subsidies. Some people have called that the 23andMe rule, which you might have heard. Um, and so sort of in summary, um, there were some positive changes that were made in 2018, but overall this farm bill was largely considered a status quo bill. Okay, and then I'm gonna share uh, in a, a few examples of some of the um, trends, impacts, um, that I would say are um, uh, in large part sort of driven by the way that we support, subsidize, incentivize um, agriculture um, through the Farm Bill in the United States. So one example is uh, the consolidation that we've seen in the agricultural industry. So this image shows uh, beginning um, in the middle of the last century, a uh, very substantial um, increase in the average size of farms in the United States. Um, at the same time, we saw a very um, large decrease in the number of farms in the, in the United States um, as they are consolidating and getting bigger and bigger. Um, and last I checked, based on the most recent census of agriculture, I believe our number of farms is still about steady um, at, the, at the low point here of about 2 million farms in the United States. Um, and so related to that, we are also experiencing a shortage of farmers in the United States. I know a lot of different industries are um, strapped for workers and experiencing shorters, uh, shortages, and agriculture is certainly one of them. Um, and in particular, we have a deficit of young farmers in the United States. Last I checked, the average age of a farmer in the United States was uh, almost 80. Uh, 58 years, um, so not too far from retirement age. Um, and so that's a real, a real problem. Um, we don't have enough young people um, kind of entering the field and hoping to fill those gaps that are going to uh, uh, very soon be left. So this map shows by county across the US the share of beginning farmers. Um, and beginning farmer, by the way, that's a, another term as, as USDA defines it means principal operators who have been on their current farms for 10 years or less. And so there's certainly variability across the country, but by and large, um, we have a deficit that is only continuing to increase. Um, and another way to help see uh, sort of what's going on related to the consolidation um, is looking at who is receiving subsidies. Um, and I'm not going to spend much too much time today really going into the details of this graph. Um, I'll just call it a couple points. So generally speaking, the largest farms in the United States that already have the greatest amount of wealth represent just a tiny fraction of farms, um, less than 3% of farms in the, in the United States. Um, yet they receive more than a third of commodity subsidies and almost half that of the ins uh, insurance payments. Um, and so we are... Uh, seeing that most payments, again, are going to the largest farms. Um, so when we see on the right-hand side of this graph, the light green and the blue bars, um, those bars are the highest. Those larger farms are getting most of the payments. Um, but the largest share of farms that are in operation, um, we see represented by the darker green bars on the left. And they're receiving just a tiny um, fraction of um, payments through the farm bill. Um, and we'll note, um, in particular, I'll call out that the second set of bars from the left, those are the farms that are reliant upon, uh, really reliant upon off farm income. Um, they can certainly not uh, make a full living based on what they're growing on their operations. 
So on this slide, I wanted to show the top commodities that were growing in the United States. Um, and I believe I uh, described briefly before, hopefully I'm not mixing up which of now my two presentations I said this in, but um, defining what our, our commodities are. Um, but these crops, again, were growing in very um, large quantity in the, in the United States, often grown in monocultures or grown just sort of by themselves on um, enormous farmland. So the, the top three commodities in the US, um, uh, corn and soy being the top two followed closely by wheat. And you can see some of the other top commodities in the US shown on this slide. So uh, on this slide, I wanted to show what we do with all of that corn that we are producing. Um, uh, corn as, as an example. So only about 10% of the corn that we grow in the US is actually used for food. Um, and so you may be aware, at least to some extent, that we use corn for different things, um, but might not be quite aware to this extent. Um, so almost 40% uh, as of 2021 of corn that we're growing um, is used in livestock feed. Almost 30% ends up in corn-based ethanol. Um, and then about 16% uh, we export. Then if we look in the bottom right of this figure, that almost 10% that ends up in the food supply. That 10% is not the um, ears of corn that some of us enjoy eating uh, every summer between Memorial Day and Labor Day. Almost all of that 10% is things like high fructose corn syrup, dextrose, starch, and other ingredients that end up in ultra processed foods. And so on this slide, I wanted to show sort of visually some of the different negative impacts of this quote, cornification of America, um, just to call it a few. So we see that little picture of the capital with dollar signs. We spend an enormous amount of money subsidizing uh, production of corn, as well as those other sub um, commodities that I mentioned. Um, uh, those subsidies help to make ultra processed foods artificially cheap. Um, which is in part driving our obesity crisis in the United States. Um, it is interfering with prices uh, and production of corn in other countries, such as Mexico. Um, it is also uh, involving a, a huge amount of chemical inputs that are running off into uh, bodies of water and contributing to problems such as the dead zone we see in the Gulf of Mexico, et cetera. Um, I'll spend just a couple of slides talking a little bit more about nutrition and health. Um, so uh, on this slide, we see a huge misalignment. Um, on the left-hand side, the uh, MyPlate image or USDA MyPlate, um, which represents our dietary guidelines, such that half of our plates should be filled with fruits and vegetables, um, whereas the, the pie chart on the right, um, which I adapted from a great organization called Farm Action, shows uh, at their latest estimate that subsidies, uh, less than 4% of our subsidies are going toward fruit and vegetable production um, in the United States. So major, major misalignment there between what we're recommending people eat and the types of crops that we subsidize. And so uh, one example of an effect of that um, is that the diets in the United States don't align with our dietary guidelines. Um, and of course, there are, I realize there are other factors leading to this, but um, uh, certainly our, uh, the way that we are subsidizing food and the way we're producing food is, is one contributing factor to this misalignment. So this graph is pulled from the 2020-2025 Dietary Guidelines for Americans, um, and the blue bars represent the subgroups for which Americans are really deficient, not consuming enough. So no surprise after what I've said, things like um, our vegetables, uh, for example, red and orange vegetables, more than 90% of Americans are not consuming enough. Whole grains, almost 100% of Americans are not consuming enough. But if we look at refined grains, um, more than 90% uh, of Americans are consuming too much. Um, so again, that shouldn't be too much of a surprise after some of what I just talked through. Okay, so I'm not gonna go through these issues in detail. Um, I, I wanna make sure Sakina has time as well, but wanted to give a few examples of some recent issues um, really affecting the entire globe that are uh, affecting um, uh, 
discussions on the Hill about what will be included in the next farm bill. Um, and certainly also, um, I'll say, uh, affecting advocacy efforts and debates in the, in the public as well. Um, so related to SNAP, um, I talked briefly about the increase, um, particularly in the last couple of years in um, spending on SNAP. And so uh, really in recent history, there are always major debates every time we reauthorize a farm bill about um, spending on SNAP and um, factors such as um, work requirements and eligibility for SNAP um, in attempts to uh, sort of constrain um, the amount of money that, that we spend on that particular program. Um, food prices and shortages. Um, so due to, due to a variety of factors such as drought, um, on the other side of that coin, sometimes even floods, um, the war in Ukraine, export restrictions, et cetera, um, that have really impacted uh, food prices and led to shortages um, throughout the country. Um, climate change, so both the impacts of climate change on the food we're producing, but also the uh, really in, in uh, recent time, maybe just the last year or so, um, through other channels, there has been a lot of um, funding and more focus from throughout federal government on um, climate change um, for mitigation of negative effects and promoting resiliency. And so um, there are certainly a lot of calls for um, continuing to um, address and um, help mitigate effects of climate change within the farm bill itself. Um, shortages throughout uh, the labor uh, supply in the food industry. Um, and oh, and I'll add, add to that as well, also calls for um, welfare for laborers in the food supply, um, uh, changing consumer trends and preferences, um, more support for organic, and then also uh, stimulus funding that was given, um, uh, billions of dollars given to um, uh, farmers throughout the last years of the pandemic. Um, so another issue I uh, didn't call out on the last slide has been increasing attention on food waste. Um, I didn't mention earlier, but there were a couple of small positive changes, um, increased attention on food waste in the 2018 Farm Bill, um, including hiring of a new food waste liaison at USDA. Um, and so I'm showing on this slide a screenshot of an op-ed that um, my co-author Dan Imhoff and I wrote in The Hill a couple of years ago earlier in the pandemic to call out the simultaneous issues that we were seeing related to increase in food waste and increase in hunger and some suggested ways to address both um, simultaneously, both through the farm bill and through other means. Um, and then I'll just to, for a moment here, we'll call it a little bit more about SNAP. Um, these are a couple of images to show uh, sort of the state of SNAP in the US, the image on the left um, to show the percent of rev uh, residents receiving SNAP benefits um, by state. And then on the right, um, just another graph that really shows um, some of the recent increases in participation in SNAP as represented by the uh, blue line and then the orange bars representing increase in spending. Um, and so I'll call out on this slide um, some examples of different recommendations um, that I'd say a wide variety of people on different sides of the aisles and with different area of expert, ex areas of expertise are calling for um, to better prioritize nutrition and optimize health outcomes for SNAP recipients. Um, so one example being better alignment between SNAP and Medicaid. Um, of course, eligibility and participation is not necessarily one to one between the two, um, but there is a lot of uh, a lot of overlap in who is eligible to participate um, and who who does participate. Um, uh, increasing the focus within SNAPED on basic cooking skills. So beyond just teaching about um, nutrition, what is included in a healthy diet, uh, making sure people know what to do with healthy food, they know um, how to put together simple, quick, healthy, um, low cost meals with the foods that they can access. Um, connecting recipients to food hubs, food sharing networks, um, uh, scrolling down a little bit. Um, many advocates, I'd say, continue to argue that maybe SNAP should be separated from the farm bill entirely. 
Um, and then sort of a bigger picture point, uh, my last bullet here, um, it's always really important to focus on improving for nutrition, um, even outside of the SNAP program to serve these vulnerable individuals before and after they participate. Um, and then the little image on the right-hand side of the slide, I wrote an op-ed in the healthcare blog a few years ago about some of these recommendations. Um, I am not gonna spend too much time on this slide, um, but in my book about the Farm Bill, I'll go through um, a whole list of some recommendations for necessary changes to the Farm Bill um, to address some of the issues that I've mentioned tonight. So for example, um, we need real income limits for subsidy recipients in the US. Um, at this time, actually for crop insurance subsidies, there are no income limits. Um, and for the commodity subsidies, there are limits, but I think it's something like $900,000 per year or something. Um, and so re ma making those uh, income limits um, more realistic and more feasible. Um, uh, another example, imposing more requirements for conservation compliance for any farmers who do receive subsidies in the US. Um, another example of recommendation. So I did just serve on the Farm Bill Task Force for the Academy, uh, the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics which is my own professional association as a dietitian. Um, and so if you're interested in reading their recommendations, uh, the summary of our recommendations, those are available online as well. Um, and then I think this is my really my last, uh, one of my last slides here. I just wanted to call out that um, I think there are positive impacts that you all can make um, regardless of what field you work in, um, whether you are publishing um, research, publishing op-eds, other articles um, to help build an evidence base and um, share important ideas about um, what works in the farm bill and maybe what doesn't work and needs improvement. Um, learning, so staying up to date on information um, and we can share and follow up maybe some, some of these recommended resources. Um, submitting written or oral testimonies at hearings, whether that's on a local level or a federal level. Um, being engaged in advocacy, um, spending your dollars, the way you spend your dollars can help to invest in local economies and keep small family farms in business, supporting young people entering farming, um, and also partnering. So if any of you are uh, involved at all in institutional procurement, maybe you can seek opportunities to partner with food hubs um, or producers that, um, again, helps to keep those dollars local and small farms in business. So this is a slide with some suggested uh, additional reading. Again, we can send this in, uh, in follow-up so we don't have to go through one by one now. Um, and then I do have a reference slide as well, but I know we are over time given our hiccup earlier. So I think with that, I will pass it over to Sakina. Thank you. I am also going to uh, play it safe and maybe not share my slides um, and just kind of stay here. So I'm Sakina Shabazz. It's so good to be with you all. I'm on staff as the policy director at the Berkeley Food Institute. And um, I wanted uh, the slides uh, for this presentation on food policy councils and the farm bill to be complementary to what Chrissy was gonna present on for the farm bill. I think we have some good context for what's in the bill, current issues surrounding it, timeline, reauthorization, spending and things of that nature. Um, and I kind of wanted to take this on as like a small research project when Stephanie approached us about talking about the roles that food policy councils might be able to play related to being involved in the farm bill. I think that this is a perhaps a burgeoning area of research. There's a lot of work already being done on the efficacy of food policy councils, key issue areas that they focus on, different levers of change and policy engagement that they can take on. And so there might be some other body of work that exists right now related to answering this question, but this was my um, short attempt at doing that. And hopefully this is something that'll keep us all in conversation and hopefully be maybe some groundwork, uh, groundwork for, for staying in communication with each other since the Farm Bill uh, reauthorization process is still going on. And so uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about Berkeley Food Institute and then try to give you all just like a brief research summary of some of the work that I found 
Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about interest groups in the farm bill and different groups that typically are engaged in the process who might have influence over how the bill shapes ultimately and what's and, and what's passed by the end of that reauthorization process and then potential areas for farm bill engagement and then hopefully this will just lead us into our Q&A session. And so Berkeley Food Institute, we're on the campus of UC Berkeley. We were founded uh, about 10 years ago, almost coming up on a decade now. And we exist to transform food systems, to expand access to healthy food, affordable food, and to promote sustainable and equitable food production. And we empower new leaders with capacities to cultivate diverse, just, and resilient and healthy food systems. This includes community engagement. This includes working with the many, many students who are on UC Berkeley's campus, both undergraduates and graduate students. This involves working with our more than 150 affiliate faculty and our key faculty directors who are on staff with us as well. BFI was founded to be part of a network of, of college, not colleges, of departments on UC Berkeley's campus. So that includes the School of Public Health, Natural Resources, Public Policy, Law, Journalism, and much more. And also being involved with different stakeholders who impact and shape California's food system, including researchers, farmers, and ranchers being part of different work groups that are maybe ran by the state government, policymakers, students, media engagement, and Folks like you all from Sustainable from Sustainable Solano and the Alliance who have an interest in being a part of the system have evidence of work of being part of it and are also thinking creatively and generatively about how that work can be deepened, especially through an avenue like the Farm Bill. At BFI, we have four key pillars of work that we focus on. They're good food access, fair and healthy jobs, rural and urban agroecology, and also racial equity. And this looks like local, state, and federal engagement. Our avenue into doing federal engagement policy is the Farm Bill. We also, to the extent possible, work with the congressional delegation um, coming out from the state of California. But at UC Berkeley, we also have an Office of Federal Relations, an Office of State Relations, who primarily in engage and interact with those folks. But when it's possible for us to do education, when it's possible for us to elevate the work of our faculty directors and other work of our partners, those are really effective avenues for engagement for us. So you've seen that slide already from Chrissy, sort of breaking down the, the dollar uh, allotment that goes to different programs. Um, the Congressional Research Service um, provided some estimated updates on 10-year uh, spending for the Farm Bill, uh, baseline spending for the Farm Bill. And it's looking, the, the pie of, of this just is really meant to demonstrate that the, that the nutrition programs in Title IV um, take up the bulk. And for this particular Farm Bill cycle going in is anticipated to be closer to 80% of the funding with the remaining um, areas, as Christy mentioned, going to crop insurance, conservation commodities, um, and the remaining uh, 10 billion or so over here going to trade, horticulture, and all the other titles that are here. And so I thought it would be helpful to, to share just like a brief overview of some research that I came across when I was trying to answer the question that Stephanie had tasked us with around um, food policy councils and the Farm Bill. And a lot of what popped up was around measuring the effectiveness of food policy councils, looking at the different ways that they engage their community strategies, um, the sort of uh, structure that they exist under, whether it's like with the local government or if they're embedded within a university or if they're a grassroots coalition and things of that nature. And I think that'll kind of lay a bit, a bit, of, lay a bit of framing for identifying how um, those avenues can also be partnered and sort of shared to think about farm bill engagement as well. So I thought it might be worth it to lay out some of that. Um, and the primary sources that are coming just from these three that I thought were good to share are primarily uh, sp specific to the state of California and also done uh, by researchers who are part of UCANR, the Agriculture and Natural Resources Extension here in the state. And so for the first one around measuring the effectiveness of food policy councils in major cities in the United States, uh, the, the initial data that they, gathered, that they gathered I thought was pretty interesting. There were about 195 food policy councils in operation across the country and also three operating in tribal nations. The majority of food policy councils, very similar to the Alliance and you know what might come from this are operational at the county level. And there's a variety of structures that go into how they're operating. They might be embedded within a local government office. They might be a task force. They might be a government affiliated advisory council, nonprofit coalition embedded within universities and things of that nature. I thought it was worth it to note though that um, the particular sample size of food policy councils that they looked at were primarily based in urban areas and not as much in rural areas or in, or in cities that kind of have an intersection for those, um, 
that kind of crossroad or, crossroad or interst interstitial space where, um, you know, an area might be both urban and rural, but I thought that was an important thing um, to mention from that, just as a sort of overlaying of, you know, the landscape for food policy councils. I thought it was also interesting to look at their metrics for efficacy as it relates back to leadership and governance, key stakeholder engagement, and for this one, really looking at opportunities for advancing food justice. There was a, a question earlier um, about, does the Farm Bill talk about um, healing justice or, or food justice and things of that nature? And the, the answer was largely no, but that there are opportunities and avenues for support from the federal government that can um, be reflected in programmatic efforts that are then taken on by community groups. And when I, when I think about food justice, I'm thinking about that as sort of being a ground up effort and being specific to the needs of that community. And when thinking about food policy councils, the ability to address and listen to and build capacity and support for what food justice looks like is a really important metric for efficacy. And so just digging in a little bit deeper related to leadership and governance, there's about um, municipal government relations, um, evidence of uh, governance documents, leadership position details, and really just having structure in place related to key stakeholder engagement, thinking about contact information, how are folks being communicated with, and essential website functions, how are you know, this information being communicated to the public, and then related to advancing food justice, commitments to diversity and inclusion. I'll also, that, also add to that equity and belonging, or DEIB, diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging is what we primarily focus on at UC Berkeley and also our racial equity work. Um, the priorities of different working groups, and also just the general resources that are available to those things. And so I just wanna offer that this might be an interesting framework to think about when it comes to where the Alliance goes in terms of um, shaping of programs and priorities for you all in the future. The Another research uh, report that I uh, found and wanted to share back was food policy councils and local governments creating effective collaboration for food systems change as a whole. Um, and this one was specific to California and they looked at 10, 10 food policy councils and they really tried to distinguish between the policy work of a council and the programmatic work of a council and how those things uh, overlap but also sort of warrant their own individuality and efforts and work that are involved there. And they specifically looked at Kern County, the city of Los Angeles, which is the biggest in the state, Mendocino County, Napa, Plumas and Sierra County have a combined uh, food policy council given uh, their proximity and also uh, population density. And then Sacramento, San Mateo, Sonoma, and Yolo. And I thought it was really interesting that the time that this report was released was also just a few months from when the 2018 Farm Bill was reauthorized by Congress, but there was no mention of Farm Bill in this particular report. And so I wonder, I don't know, for the researchers who are putting this together, I also wonder if they were thinking about the Farm Bill reauthorization and different efforts that might have been complementary to the work that they were doing, or if it was more so siloed. I imagine it might have been a bit more siloed, but I think that maybe in the past there have been different opportunities for food policy councils to also be actively involved in um, Farm Bill reauthorization conversations, given that they happen every five years. And so the concurrence of those two things stood out to me, but maybe I'll go back and email the researchers and see if Farm Bill was, was on their mind at all. Um, and one of the different things that they highlighted were the policy achievements of the food policy councils that they featured. And so passing a food day resolution, um, passing a, a beekeeping ordinance, backyard livestock ordinances, um, creating a position for a farm ob um, ombudsman, that is not an easy word to say, um, creating a food action plan, urban agriculture goals. Some of these things are tangential to the farm bill. And so, um, I think just in, in highlighting what those achievements look like can also offer some, some reference to you all. And then the last one that was in there was understanding food policy councils, specifically in relation to extension partners. And the main takeaways from this had to do with the framing of organizational priorities and the, the framing of policy priorities. And so in the surveying that they did for that, some of the, the top organizational priorities in terms of their, their surveying, the top three responses that came out, related to advocacy and capacity building, policy capacity building, community engagement, networking, research and data collection, education, fundraising, so on and so forth. When we're thinking about the farm bill, that is definitely advocacy and policy capacity building. It takes a lot of work in the off years between you know years maybe zero and three and zero and four in leading up to another farm bill reauthorization to garner, to garner interest amongst grassroots groups 
to um, identify congressional champions who can pay attention to particular issue areas that you want to raise in the next farm bill reauthorization. And when the bill is not being authorized, as Chrissy mentioned in her presentation, there are some programs that have to go through an annual appropriation process, which are points of leverage to engage members of Congress on. Um, there are needs for research, there are needs for evaluation, there are needs for program promotion for all the programs that are authorized um, uh, by, by the Farm Bill and um, managed by the U.S. Department of Agriculture and potentially in operation in your county or in a region of, of the state that you're in, in in California. And so while these things relate to the broader issue areas and sort of policy building areas for food policy councils, these are potential points of entry when thinking about farm bill engagement. The other one that stood out were um, the, the specific uh, policy priorities that the food policy councils that they sampled for that final research report came up with. And healthy food access like takes the cake for the issue areas that are being raised here, which really makes me think about the nutrition title, Title IV, and the different programs that are operating there. But also thinking about other supports for farmers in terms of um, local access to markets in terms of thinking about um, uh, supply chain management and being able to, you know, pr provide the goods that they're growing in the regions where they're producing those goods. And so these different things don't map on, you know, title by title, but it definitely makes me think about the nutrition title. It makes me think about um, strengthening local processing and things of that nature. And a lot of these other things are also going to be very specific to the local government context and the state government context. But knowing that healthy food access of this particular sample was so high and also knowing that uh, Sustainable Solano has also done some work in that area makes me think that there is a lot of rich sort of knowledge and information here that can be gleaned when thinking about the roles of food policy councils and farm bill. This slide talks a little bit about some of the key players involved in actually reauthorizing the farm bill and thinking about some of those levers that you all might get involved in and by and large, it's really important to identify upfront that within the House of Representatives and that within the Senate, there is a respective House Agriculture Committee, and there is also a Senate Agriculture Committee. And on the next slide, I'm going to talk about some of the, the members from the California delegation in Congress who are part of the House Agriculture Committee. There are no there are no senators from California who are on the Senate Agriculture Committee, but Senator Feinstein is part of the Appropriations Committee for Senate related to food and agriculture, and I think food safety as well. But in terms of these key players, you need to know that there's a Senate Agriculture Committee, House Agriculture Committee, and that the House Agriculture Committee has four members from California who have in the back of your mind as you know potential points of engagement. Also, the US Department of Agriculture, I think this is pretty forward, but they are the primary agency at the federal level that is responsible for implementing, evaluating, and managing all the programs that are authorized in the Farm Bill. At the end of uh, the authorization process, hopefully the House and Senate are um, working well together to pass a balanced uh, farm bill, but ultimately it has to be signed off by the White House. And so if we get a farm bill that is significantly imbalanced, where priorities of one group over another group are not um, shaping out how, um, how they want it to be or is really not being done in a bipartisan manner, um, if it is not to the satisfaction of, of the president who, you know, represents the Democratic Party, the president might not sign the bill, which means it gets sent back to Congress, which means they have more negotiating and reauthorizing to do. And so there's a bit of check, there's a lot of checks and balance involved in this process, and it's a really drawn out process for a reason. You also have members of Congress who are specifically authoring marker bills that are meant to be introduced into Congress, but not meant to be passed on their own. For example, you, uh, one of the big bills that was just reintroduced into Congress is the Agricultural, um, Agricultural Resilience Act that was introduced by Representative Shelley Pingree and is a very dense bill and covers a lot of uh, issues related to conservation and energy and nutrition and, and food safety and all these different things. Um, and she is part of the House Agriculture Committee, but that bill on its own is not meant to be passed. It's meant to garner interest amongst different members of Congress to ultimately be included in the final uh, farm bill that's reauthorized at the end of this particular cycle. And so you have members from the Democratic Party and the Republican Party introducing marker bills, generating interest, hopefully generating bipartisan interest on these different issue areas so that they're ultimately included in the farm bill and funded for those five years to come after. You also have the ranking members of the chairs and ranking members of the House Agriculture Committee and of the Senate in the House. 
It is primarily controlled by Republicans right now. And the chair is G.T. Thompson from Pennsylvania. And the ranking member is Representative Scott from Georgia. And hopefully there is some bipartisan interaction and support going on there. I think that there largely is between those two members. Um, but right now the chair is a member of the Republican party in the Senate because it's Democrat, Democrat controlled. Um, the chair of the Senate Agriculture Committee is uh, Debbie Stabenow of Michigan. I can't remember who the Republican uh, uh, ranking member is, but very similar format as to the um, House Agriculture Committee. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about interest groups as we get closer to, to closer to the end. But just these are a lot of the players that are involved in this. And interest groups, you know, ultimately could be the could be the alliance, could be sustainable Solano, could, depending on the different issue areas that you want to raise. And so in California, these are the key players sh shaping the next farm bill. We have Representative Doug Lamalfa from the first congressional district, who's a Republican, Representative Jim Costa from California Congressional District 21, um, who's a Dem, Representative John Duarte, who's also a Republican from California Congressional District 13, and then Representative Salute Carbajal from um, California Congressional District 24. Um, Representative Panetta, who represented, Jimmy Panetta, who represented the Central Coast, was on the House Agriculture Committee. Also, uh, Representative Ro Khanna was as well, but after the 2022 midterm elections, they were no longer on, um, on the House Agriculture Committee, but there are still four people representing California and the diversity of interests that come across the state. And so when thinking about engaging members of Congress coming from different sides of the aisle, I think that's really a, a rich opportunity for bipartisan engagement because the, you know, one member might not go so hard and support like a particular nutrition program, but they will be really um, animated and, and looking for opportunities maybe to support farmers and, and different people that are in their districts. And so when thinking about coalition building and engaging with members of Congress on this, having a diverse coalition of people who are pushing issues that pertain back to the state is really important, given that there is you know equal Democratic and Republican representation on the House Agriculture Committee. And because um, I said before, Senator Feinstein is on one of the appropriations committee for, for uh, the Senate Agriculture Committee. She's not particularly high ranking, but she is still in that position. Um, Representative Barbara Lee, though, from the 12th Congressional District for California is in a really powerful appropriations position for um, the House Appropriations Committee for the Subcommittee on, on Agriculture and I think Food and Drug Safety. Um, and she is one of the highest ranking African American members in Congress right now. And she is representing um, the Bay Area, not too far from Solano County, but is largely representing the interests of folks coming from California who have interest in this particular farm bill. And from Solano County, two members of Congress uh, from Congressional District 4, Representative Mike Thompson and Representative John Garamendi from Congressional District 8. Neither of these people are on the House Agriculture Committee. But at the end of the day, every member of Congress is going to have to vote on the Farm Bill. And so we want members of Congress who are educated on priorities coming from California, who are educated on priorities coming from your particular region or district or county that need to be elevated to them. And so in some of the groups that we participate in, like the California Caucus for the National Sustainable Agriculture Coalition or the California um, Farmer Justice Collaborative, there's a lot of tailored um, outreach and education that is done to members of the House Agriculture Committee because they're going to be part of that authoring process for the bill. But ultimately, when the bill makes it to the House floor, you don't want people voting against your interests that relate back to your district. And so while there's that targeted outreach that's done, I don't think there's any harm that can be done talking to a member of Congress about the importance of the Farm Bill, why they need to pay attention to it, and the issues that are coming up from your district. And a, a food policy council, a member of a food policy council can do that. Um, someone from a, a plain citizen can do that. And so I think these are really rich and um, fun opportunities to, to be engaged. And that's something that is always front of mind when we're in, being involved in coalition engagement. And this is my last slide. And so I just wanted to leave you all with some ideas, maybe going into the rest of uh, the farm bill year. The process has been significantly delayed because of the midterm elections. And then also if I can just jog everybody's mind back to January, 2023, uh, it took a really long time for Kevin McCarthy to become speaker of the house, which delayed house business significantly. And so we're at the point now where marker bills are still being introduced in Congress. 
Um, I think they're just now getting to the stages where they're starting to draft, uh, where the House and Senate are starting to draft their own versions of the Farm Bill. But once they do that, they have to go into a conference committee and reconcile both versions of the bill. And if there are things that they don't like, they have to take it back to their respective chambers and do it again. And so if they can get to a point where they have a reconciled version of that bill, they will then take that version of the bill to their respective, uh, to the Senate floor and to the House floor to be voted on. And then, you know, I, in an ideal world, um, they will continue that process. It'll end up on the, on the White House desk to be signed, but there's a lot of back and forth that happens there. And so um, there are still opportunities to engage with members of Congress and one of the ways to do that or has been done up to this point are listening sessions. Um, the California Department of Food and Agriculture last fall held four listening sessions across the state. We were able to participate in one of them. It was hosted at Urban Tilth, um, a farm in Richmond, California, but they also had one, um, I think they had two in the Central Valley, one down in San Diego, and then they, I think they planned a fifth one, but I can't remember where it was, but I think it was in a more rural area. And so, um, when CDFA is undertaking that, they're representing the interests of agriculture for the entire state of California, and they want to hear from groups like Sustainable Solano and from the Alliance to hear what those issues are for your particular district and for your particular county that hopefully they can take and incorporate. Their farm bill priorities have already been released, but this is something that happens with every farm bill cycle. There will always be list listening sessions. And also members of Congress from folks who are on the House and Senate Agriculture Committees are also hosting listening sessions in their respective districts. And so that's something to participate in, keep an eye out for, and to, to, to think about. Um, you also can just meet with your member of Congress, the two folks who were mentioned before, to talk about the Farm Bill as a whole and what some of those issue areas are that are important to you all. I think food policy councils can also be involved in research, evaluation, supporting pilots, and also promoting programs that are funded by the Farm Bill. That might feel a little bit intuitive already, but you know there might be a new program that's ultimately authorized that folks in your district don't know a lot about, and so you know, sharing information in public forum, working with your local Department of Human Services or things of that nature to make sure that those programs are, are being promoted is, is also really important. Um, and that's not just for nutrition, that's also for conservation. As Chrissy mentioned in the miscellaneous title, you know, opportunities for first time farmers or farmers who are identified as socially disadvantaged farmers and ranchers, I think in the state of California. SDFR is also a, a, a functional title that is used by the USDA coming out of um, specific uh, class action lawsuits where there was evidence of discrimination against black farmers, Latinx farmers, native farmers, and women farmers. And so the title socially disadvantaged farmer and rancher is primarily used by USDA. I think within the California Department of Agriculture, they're more likely to use BIPOC farmer or underserved farmer. And so you might see different terminology being, being used, but I think they're all trying to get at an opportunity to engage farmers who have been systemically and historically disadvantaged and left out of processes related to promoting programs and participating in programs on par with their white counterparts, specific white male counterparts specifically. Um, also, every uh, there are several farm service agency um, offices across the state of California that are also responsible for promoting um, programs for farmers, credit opportunities, crop insurance opportunities, and things of that nature. And so if y'all have never met with someone from the FSA, I think that would be a really interesting uh, int introductory meeting to have, just to know who they are, to see who they're serving in your, in your respective district, who are the farmers that they're um, working with. And also that is really, really important if the area that you're in is prone to fires or natural disasters or drought or things of that nature, because the FSA is responsible for doling out those funds and keeping track of farmers who are eligible for those benefits at the federal level. And so that isn't something that, you know, a food policy council would have to administer on their own, but it would be a really interesting opportunity just to know who they are and what they do and who they're serving in your, in your particular community. Um, I'll also add that coalition building and storytelling related to the Farm Bill is really, really important. My first introduction to this introduction to this was doing work related to food and nutrition and uh, working with folks who participated in the SNAP program who had a story to tell. Maybe they were using SNAP because they lived in, a, in an area in the Gulf Coast that uh, was flooded out because of a hurricane 
or they were a family that uh, that was in um, like Flint, Michigan, when the water crisis happened, and they became eligible for disaster snap because the water coming out of the pipes was not potable for them to drink. Or maybe they lived in a fire prone area in the state and members of Congress, they need to hear that. <laughs> they need to know how their constituents are being impacted by potential political changes coming down the pipeline that would limit access to really crucial food assistance. But also they need to hear from farmers, they need to hear from uh, food service administrators. They need to hear from uh, people who are administering these programs and experiencing burnout and need more funding just to make sure that their offices can operate at an effective rate so that they can you know, run these programs that have been authorized through a congressional process that was really important and made these programs available. And so think about who's in your community. Do they have a story to tell? Is there something that you know should be elevated in that way? Um, and one of the groups that I, I mentioned before that we're a part of is the National Sustainable Agriculture Coalition. They largely represent gra grassroots organizations across the across the country and have different sort of levels of participation. And we're a, a non-voting member of NSAC because we can't lobby. Berkeley Food Institute is part of the University of California at Berkeley, which is a state institution, and we don't um, really endorse anything that is not the official position of our federal relations team or our state. Uh, relations team, but we do educate and we can advocate and we can do media engagement and we can do storytelling. You have to get really, really creative when you can't lobby. And uh, if those are specific contours that the um, that sustain that sustainable Solana was working with, or if it's ultimately included in your in your bylaws as a as an alliance, you know, turn food policy council that you don't want lobbying to be a part of that too. There are many, many, many other avenues for engagement that don't say, you know, endorse Senate Bill 105 or or endorse, you know, HR, you know, uh, 1355 or, or things of that nature. That is a very specific constraint that we are under, and so we lean heavily into our coalition building and our storytelling. And the last thing I'll mention is that we are going into an election year and a farm bill year and so many other things. And I think that is incredibly exciting. And I've heard from other advocates that farm bills don't get passed in election years, but I don't know, it kind of has to happen. Uh, the farm bill, the current farm bill is set to expire on September 30th, which has can have a lot of precipitous effects, but maybe Congress can, you know, do what they're voted in and tasked to do and, and get that done. Um, but going into an election year, a really exciting thing that BFI did before, specifically for a state race, was put on a, a food candidate forum for two people who were running to represent um, the Bay Area. It was uh, somebody member Buffy Wicks, and I don't remember who the other person was, but I, I linked it there. And those are, you know, bipartisan opportunities to bring those people to the table to talk about their priorities related to food and agriculture and also to invite the community into that process as well. Sometimes folks don't show up because it's not a priority for them, but I think that speaks volumes if they're not willing to engage with you on issues related to food and agriculture because that will always relate back to the state of California because we're a leading producer for so many different things across the state. And so, you know, going into an election year and a farm bill year, I think it's going to be really exciting. And this, you know, this doesn't just have to, I know we're talking about the farm bill, but this can also relate back to um, state races as well for members of the assembly and of the California Senate, or even the mayor, even, you know, folks, the county administrator, anybody can be engaged on these particular topics. And I think it's a really fun and interesting opportunity to bring, you know, groups, folks of people from different um, backgrounds that might not necessarily crossover on any given day, but are definitely adjacent and create, and, you know, lead back to, you know, your local area or your state having a stronger food system. And so I want to leave you with that. And I will uh, stop here and stop sharing my, my slides. And I think we can transition into some Q&A. And thank you all for being here. I know it's after five o'clock on a Thursday. Um, but it was really interesting to, to think about these questions and to also have them be complimentary to what Chrissy um, shared with us about the farm bill and the different contours of that. So I will stop there and um, yeah, let's let's talk and see where this goes. Thank you, thank you to both of you. That was like really rich and a lot of information and I'm really grateful <laughs> for both of you and that presentation. And I love that you kind of customized it. Um, I'm actually gonna turn this over to Elena at this point. Thank you, Stephanie. I'll take it from here. Uh, Christina Sakina, huge uh, thank you. Um, 
I actually was listening to you, Sakina, thinking, could we bring you back to the Alliance meeting? Because there's so much to absorb and you're so, so right. There's so much potential in this work. And we've been focusing more on programmatic. It was very interesting distinction, but we are ready and we need to move to its policy work. And you're just such a wealth of both of you. But because, you know, you were so on the point for our local work here, really would be interested to continue this dialogue with you. We'll be if I will be here. I hope we're not going anywhere. So, <laughs> yeah, let us know if we can, you know, get together in, in, in person for another meeting or, you know, if there's an event that you all are thinking about hosting in the future. Um, you know, we, we co-sponsor things all the time. I think the summer is going to be a really rich opportunity to, like, sit and think about what folks want to do. I look forward to having that time. Now that the, the school year is ending, I'm like, I don't know, ne next Friday, May 12th, I think. And so we're running on an academic calendar. And so we really value having that time when the semester is calmer and to think strategically about how to engage in the fall and the kind of things that we want to do on campus with our students. But also we've always had one foot on campus and one foot in the community and, and in policy engagement. So I invite you to also sit and think with us if that if that feels good we will excellent thank you now we're open uh, we have about 15 minutes we are open for questions ah, yes hi first just thank you both for being here today and bringing all of your knowledge uh, it was really great presentations um my question is a little bit of a clarifying one i noticed you talked about there being time for public comment from community members has those passed already for community, yes, okay, thank yeah, you. The, 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 the listening sessions typically are in the fall before the, the reauthorization um, process in Congress really kicks off, um, or even in like a year out. By the time Congress is getting to the point where they're, um, you know, introducing marker bills, fielding marker bills, and getting the, the text of the actual farm bill that comes together, um, the listening sessions and things have ideally kind of wrapped up by then. One of the other things I didn't mention are fly-ins. Um, so many fly-ins have, uh, Chrissy, I feel like there are probably nutrition fly-ins and like food fly-ins. There's definitely a farmer fly-in. There was a huge climate and farmer fly-in the first week of March. And so not quite a listening session, but definitely pounding the pavement on Capitol Hill. So I also want to add that in there as a complimentary way to get you know, issues elevated to members of Congress, but typically the listening sessions are in the lead up to the reauthorization and to really synthesize and distill the issues that folks want to raise to their members um, and that um, folks want to want to hear from their constituents. So, uh, yeah, I think the window for that is closed, but um, it's going to happen again. It's going to happen again with the next reauthorization. You want to add anything, Chrissy? To add just um yeah so and and national sustainable ag coalition that Keenan mentioned earlier was the main group that coordinated this major plan and since I live in DC I did get to go to part of it um uh what was that about a month and a half ago um but there are also other professional organizations um like I know again in the field of nutrition there are some that kind of coordinate these big uh like advocacy summits Next week, there's a big one. Um, if you know the organization, Food Frac, Food Research Advocacy Coalition, maybe, and they're doing this big like anti-hunger policy conference next. I believe it's next week in DC. So they're all coming here, and then they'll, you know, part of their time together will be, I'm sure, kind of rally and get excited. But then they'll also go uh, on the hill and meet with their members of Congress. Oh yes, thanks, Sakina. Um, and so th those things are all happening. And the other point that I did want to mention too, some of these like listening sessions and all that are happening, um, uh, while it may be too late to kind of get involved and participate, um, and it might be new this uh, farm bill since so many things have gone online, but like all of these hearings and briefings on the Hill and these listening sessions that are happening all around the country are online and streaming. And so like, I was just, um, I, I watched one happening in Texas the other day, and I was watching a couple on the Hill earlier today. So again, even though you can't necessarily participate, it's still, I think, interesting and valuable to hear what all these different stakeholders across the country are saying, those you agree with, those you don't agree with, 
How do the members of Congress respond? What are the questions coming from members of Congress? So if you have just like a little spare time, you can play some of these in the background um, uh, on, the committee's, on the committee's website, they'll be streaming. Thank you. And uh, Sakina put uh, the link on the chat. Thank you very much. And Susan has her hand up. Susan, please um, unmute yourself. Oh, okay. I guess I am unmuted. Um, thank you. Well, I just had uh, a question come up from the last thing you said, Christine, about uh, how these things are streaming online, uh, the committee meetings and stuff. I mean, would that be on, what's the name of that government uh, channel on TV? Is that what you're talking about? No, I'm just, I'm going to put another link in the chat because I literally ha still have it up on my screen. I was watching this one earlier today. So this oh. is the um, Senate uh, Ag Committee, the Senate Committee on Agriculture, Nutrition, and Forestry. And they they had, oh, sorry, Subcommittee on Commodities, Risk Management, and Trade. And so um, this was actually on Capitol Hill this morning. Um, there was kind of a hearing. And so there were different... Um, Subsidies and um, trade, did you say? Sorry, Did you say sub uh, subcommittee on commodities, risk management, okay. and trade. But okay. that's just one example. I just put that link in the chat, and so if you, um, you know, follow that link and just search around on the Senate Ag Committee's website, you can. Pro I'm sure you could see a calendar of all the upcoming hearings, um, and then you know, on okay. the House side, and things. So that's just again one example of what is now a recording of the event that happened this morning. Yeah. Fantastic. The other thing I wanted to just say is uh, I'm sort of feeling like that uh, little girl from Sweden who talks about climate change and nothing happens, nobody listens, everything stays the same. This it seems like like I'm feeling like that, you know, like uh, the way that this whole bill is set up is to support the commodity growers and they're the ones that are doing all the bad stuff, you know. Ones with the most lobbying dollars too. Yeah, um, I mean, we have to change that. Uh, uh, considering climate change, you know, we're having fires, we're having drought, we're having floods. All, uh, you know, the people who uh, are least causing this stuff are suffering the most, and people who are, you know, need food the worst are, are the most affected. You know, and the and the food that you guys are giving them. Poor people, are, it's no good for them and they're getting sick. And they live in, you know, food. Uh, I'm sorry, my phone is ringing. I mean, you see what I mean? I feel like, oh, this is omnibus bill, you know, that's so big that we can't do anything about it and it's creating all of these problems. I mean, yeah, you kind of summarized some of what I was trying to convey in my presentation. And I would even add to that, you know, our massive problem of chronic diet related disease you pointed out like low-income yeah. americans but yes. americans at all income levels are eating bad food and sick as well yes. we spend more on health care than any other developed country in the world so um yes enormous enormous problem um 1%, yeah. Yeah. having said that and hopefully like some of what um sakina and i tried to get across today is yes it's a there are many big problems there are many barriers um, and none of us in our lifetimes can like change it, but we can all play a small positive part and we kind of feel called to do that. And so I think, you know, when we are informed and we are passionate and whatever our sort of sphere of influence is, whether we are local food advocates in Solano in California or, uh, you know, healthcare providers in Washington, DC or farmers in Illinois, um, there are positive impacts we can make on the farm bill itself, engaging in some of the ways Sakina mentioned, but also every other way we connect with the food system. Again, the way that we spend our dollars, the way we educate our children, um, you know, the way we- uh, uh, But the policy at the policy level. I, again, I, again, hear you. Um, <laughs> you know, individual stuff doesn't count at all in terms of what the, the the terrifying, you know, effects of climate crisis that are related to these huge, you know, uh, bare soil operations, you know, that are doing heavy tilling and putting all the uh, chemicals in the soil that kill the microbes, you know, and all that. I mean, that's re directly related to climate crisis. 
Agreed. I mean, there there have been some efforts to to link more issues of of climate and agricultural production, especially under the current um, USDA secretary's you know policy efforts, Secretary Vilsack, and the the large umbrella of that you know, is climate, what's what's being referred to as climate smart agriculture. I mean, that's a big priority in the state of California, but, you know, climate yeah. smart agriculture doesn't necessarily, the phrasing of that doesn't necessarily land as well in states that have more conservative majorities or less interest and inclination to addressing issues of, you know, climate change and things of that nature. And so the task is definitely to, to get more people on board and to make sure that farmers have the resources that they need to employ those practices that are healthier for the ground, that are more healthy for the soil, that are, you know, better for, for human health, make a better, you know, sort of crop and product ultimately from those practices. Yeah. Um, and that, that, you know, the efforts for that is being driven from the ground up as well. People want to do more regenerative agriculture, more organic and sustainable agriculture. It's on USDA to meet those people where they are and give them what they need. I think the other challenge of that too is that if that you know in 2024, if there is a, a political change in the White House, um, you, you know, will we will we still have climate smart agriculture? Will we still have the phrasing for that? Will we still have as much investment and attention on those particular issues if you know there's a change in the administration that is going to change? potentially who the secretary is and the priorities of the entire USDA. And so the fickleness of, of political change is what we're also dealing with and makes it really hard to have sustained investment because that's just how our political system is set up. And sometimes it works really well and sometimes it doesn't, it feels like it's not working at all. And so I think it's really important to capitalize on the moment right now and also to make sure that the funding that was made available from the Inflation Reduction Act for conservation programs does not get sucked back into Congress, but it's also going to be on USDA to make sure that money gets out to people so they can do more conservation e easements and, you know, do more, more with the EQIP program and things like that and uh, just, you know, just keep the train moving. Um, but we'll see. We'll see next November what, what that looks like. Hopefully not. Well, not I heard much. about the lady, the rep uh, yeah. from, uh, where does he live? She's a farmer from back of Vermont or Maine. Shelly Pingree. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Is that a good thing? I mean, would that be significant? Yeah. The Agricultural Resilience Act that she sponsored is capturing everything that you said related to making sure that that link between climate and agriculture is being addressed and remediated and also investing in communities and farmers at the same time. We'll see if that gets included. It's not, by, the bill is not bipartisan co-sponsored at this point, but it is. Um, she was a real, she's been a champion for uh, a lot of things related to food and, and ag, but um, you might remember I mentioned one particular program in the farm bill, the local agriculture marketing program that, um, uh, was added and uh, made permanent. And that was something that she championed um, in the last iteration. And I remember being on the phone with some of her staffers, actually, one of whom is now in the White House, um, but to ask questions as I was working on my book about this local agriculture marketing program. And so, again, she championed it and it, it got into the farm bill um, as it was passed. So, yeah, mm -hmm. it can happen. And, and so her bill is actually, Christina, I think you are talking about local food. Is it a local food promotion program, USDA? Uh, um, LAMP, Local Agriculture Marketing Program. Okay. LAMP is the acronym. Yeah. yeah, I think it's uh, it's 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 all it's, it's sometimes very frustrating, right? Because we're dealing with such a huge issue. But I also want to you know stress that every level still counts, even if it sounds sometimes it looks like not. And there was a perfect question for us in the chat to kind of wrap up this conversation from Marion. Is there a food policy council in Solana County? So, yeah. oh, sorry, go ahead. No, please, if you, if you want to say something, yeah. Oh, no, I was just going to say, when, when we were meeting with Stephanie to prepare for this, my understanding was that there wasn't a food policy council. We don't that, call it as such, right? Like, and that's no. exactly, you know, what happened in Solana County is uh, we really didn't even have a concept of local food system. Solana County is an agricultural county and it's dealt with as agriculture. You know, so uh, about 2014, we started working with a more holistic approach to this, exact to cover all the challenges and all the issues 
because you can't solve one without another. And that's how the alliance was born. And we couldn't even call it Food Policy Council because we still have another entity that is called FANS, Food, Ag, and Nutrition Network of Salana County. And it's an old creation of Department of Public Health that historically represented Salana County on the California Food Policy Council. So we just have a little, you know, hiccup, a little gap, but we are working now to pretty much merge these two agencies, at least in parts of policy. And that's why it's so important for us. So we, we are the Food Policy Council. That's exciting. That's a new yeah. frontier. I hope it, it works. It is a new frontier. As you all wanted to. So I think we're at six o'clock. We said we're going to finish at six to respect everyone's time. Thank you again to our wonderful speakers and to all of you who stayed with us through these technical hiccups and asked questions. Uh, we are recording. We're going to post it. Uh, I think we are capturing uh, most of the chat. So the links will be captured on that as well. The Alliance webpage, um, Allison, could we just briefly put it on the chat so you could look at the Salana Local Food System Alliance webpage. We encourage you to learn, to get engaged, to get involved, and we will see you again very time, very soon. Paula is asking, is this bill the place to move subsidies for big ag to smaller sustainable farms? Um, I think the farm bill um, historically has provided a lot of resources for large scale farmers across the country, especially farmers that are growing commodities like um, corn, wheat, sorghum, sugar, things of that nature. Um, and when thinking about different subsidies that are you know, made available to farmers, the commodity title definitely comes to mind. Um, and I think the bill as a whole, um, I don't know necessarily about moving subsidies from big ag to, to smaller ag. I think Congress is uh, definitely keeping their pulse on different resources that are going to be available to farmers of all sizes. And especially there's a larger interest, especially on smaller farmers, on first time farmers, on farmers that are uh, fall under the category of being socially disadvantaged farmers and ranchers. And so I think that um, the movement away from subsidies for, for big ag is definitely going to have to be a larger advocacy push, usually from the ground up. Um, but there definitely should be more incentives and, and subsidies available to smaller, sustainable um, farmers and producers as well. That's definitely on pulse for, it's sort of something on pulse for like groups like NSAC, the National Sustainable Agriculture Coalition and things of that nature. Um, I think one other area that's of interest to a lot of advocates as well is crop insurance and other supports for organic farmers and farmers that prioritize climate smart agriculture practices and sustainable growing methods um, and just making sure that their revenue streams can sort of stay intact. And so um, I think to the larger question, yes, this is the bill. <laughs> the farm bill would be the area to address that. But um, I think the I think it's about expanding the, the pie as a whole and definitely some would definitely argue that big ag, um, big farmers and wealthier farmers definitely get too many subsidies. I think there was actually a something that came out in the Washington Post about that maybe sometime this week around um, subsidies for farmers um, and that being um, a large expense incurred by the USDA specifically. And so, but yes, this is the bill to address that. Um, is there any mention of healing justice in the farm bill? One could hope, one would wish. <laughs> um, and uh, I think that, I, you know, I think there's an important distinction to be made between food security, nutrition security, you know, food justice, um, and I suppose healing justice as well. Um, the farm bill, specifically through the nutrition title, when we're thinking about nutrition programs, which um, Chrissy is going to give a fantastic overview of in terms of all the different titles that are available in the bill or currently in the bill. Um, the nutrition title is what particularly focuses on the SNAP program, the food distribution program on Indian reservations and things of that nature. Um, and when we think about maybe food as medicine or food as a tool for healing, you know, bodies, healing um, communities, getting people back to um, particular food ways that are specific to them culturally or in terms of their region, 
Um, I think the Farm Bill has the capacity to support and invest in programs in ways that also facilitate healing for communities. Um, historically, it has not. <laughs> that is not the origins of the Farm Bill. The origins of the Farm Bill go back to like the New Deal, 1933, World War II, um, significant amounts of food production and extraction from the land that led to the Dust Bowl and making sure that crop insurance was available to farmers and price protections were available to farmers and that there were significant outputs for um, surplus, uh, surplus goods that ultimately made its way into, you know, international food assistance and domestic um, hunger relief programs and things of that nature. And so I think when we think about healing justice and when we think about food justice, I think about that coming from the ground up, not from the federal government down, though they can be complementary. And I think that there are tools available through the federal government, especially through the Farm Bill, that do aid communities in that kind of work. But I don't think that's ultimately going to come from the federal government. I think that's going to come from communities and from different um, grassroots efforts and from what people want to see for themselves that are um, largely driven by their own priorities and their, you know, desire to be self-determinant for their own communities and for their families. But I do think, I hope that the Farm Bill can be facilitating of that, but ultimately will not be the final authority on what healing justice looks like. Certainly not. Um, Susan, with, to my knowledge, there are no subsidies at all going to farmers who grow specialty crops, which is how the Farm Bill describes vegetables and fruits. Yes, that is correct. Um, the specialty crops are pretty much anything that are not the commodities. So fruits, apples, grapes, almonds, kiwis, all kinds of things. California is the lead producer of, of specialty crops in the, in the country. Um, is that the case? Subsidies are going to commodity crops, which is all the stuff that's not sustainable and causing climate crisis. Um, I'm not, I don't know that I can answer that with as much um, knowledge specifically, but I do know that a lot of subsidies are available for commodities and larger, um, larger sort of crops that are grown that ultimately do go into um, like food byproducts and things like that are going to being feed for animals or ultimately go into um, food assistance programs and commodity assistance programs. Um, I would have to go back and look. I don't wanna say that there are no subsidies available for specialty crops, but I would not be surprised if that was the case. Um, partly because they're pretty high income generating, especially in a state like California, that's definitely a, a cash crop and something that a lot of farmers um, make their livelihoods off of and also make really good you know, incomes, depending on the, the size and viability of those kinds of farms. Um, I would, uh, yeah, I would say tightly connected to issues around climate change, especially when you think about um, just how much work it takes to produce corn, how much work it takes to produce wheat and things of that nature, um, the release of carbon and stuff, especially from tilling. And so, yeah, there's definitely more connection there, but I don't, I don't want to say that there are none for specialty crops, but I feel like you're probably onto something, Susan. There's another question that says the Farm Bill comes around every five years. Yes, that is the reauthorization schedule for the Farm Bill. It is a Farm Bill year. The last one was passed. Um, the Agricultural Improvement Act of 2018 it was passed in December 2018. And so yes, we are in a Farm Bill reauthorization year. Um, what else is here? Are soil amendments, particularly biochar, mentioned in the Farm Bill? Um, there might be some um, marker bills introduced related to biochar. I think that would fall under the energy title because I think that would be an energy source, but it might also fall under, um, I don't think it would be the conservation title. I think it might be under the, um, the energy title. I'm not as familiar. I know it's a, bi a byproduct that can be used um, to help sequester carbon, but um, I'm not as familiar, but I think it might be under the energy title. Um, for Susan's question related to transitioning to sustainable farming, the, there are no uh, subsidies for that, but there are some really interesting um, uh, organic transition assistance programs at the state level and at the federal level. Um, at the state level, during the last legislative cycle, there was an organic transition assistance bill that was introduced in the legislature and ultimately the bill didn't pass, but through the budget act, there was $5 million allocated to the California Department of Food and Agriculture for an organic transition assistance uh, program 
um, with some set aside for BIPOC farmers in the state. That's to help with um, revenue losses during that initial transition period and also for technical assistance. At the federal level, the Department of uh, USDA Agricultural Marketing Service recently announced the TOP program or Transition to Organic Partnership Program, which was a, gosh, maybe $100 million investment from USDA to help farmers transition to organic, also through technical assistance, um, sub not subsidies, payments and support, uh, income supports for farmers in that transition process, and also to think about career pathways for people who want to be involved um, through regional networks and helping farmers in that transition. We were written into the Transition to Organic Partnership Program for the state of California, but specifically looking at um, career pathways um, for students who might have an interest in maybe thinking about organic certification or technical assistance or appropriate technology for farmers, but it's not subsidized in the same way that large scale agricultural commodities are, but there are incentives and in increasing support for farmers that wanna transition to organic. Um, I hope that was helpful. Um, might be watching. I don't see any other questions. Oh, do ongoing debt ceiling talks impact the farm bill, Mike? Yes, they do. Yes, they do. Uh, Speaker McCarthy, gosh, was it last week? Uh, just closely, narrowly got um, the House's version of a budget bill through that had significant um, cuts to SNAP and the implementation of work requirements for the SNAP program. Work requirements are specifically for people who are considered able-bodied adults without dependents or ABODs, and that would require them to have evidence of searching for a job up to 20 hours a week or evidence of working 20 hours a week to be eligible for benefits. And if they are not participating in an eligible work activity, then they would only be eligible to participate in SNAP or formerly known as food stamps for three months out of the out of a three year or 36 month period. And there are some states that already have work requirements in place, other states uh, don't have them, but making that a federal mandate across the board would be really challenging because the implementation of that largely would fall on states. And there has been significant evidence that the implementation of work requirements is really technically challenging, especially when it comes to being able to report um, eligible activities, but also in areas of high unemployment, also coming out of the pandemic, putting that extra pressure on someone who either lives in an area that's economically depressed or just for whatever other reason can't secure appropriate amounts of work to be able to feed themselves would be really, really challenging. That is largely something that Democrats have been pushing against, um, but because of the political majority um, in the House with Republicans, that was something that was you know, not immediately um, rejected from the House version of the budget bill to address the debt ceiling. But, it probably won't make it through the Senate, um, given that it's uh, primarily um, the political uh, majority in, in the Senate is Democrats, but that's a really big issue. The SNAP program is funded by the Farm Bill, specifically through the, through the nutrition title. I have one picture that I'm going to show you guys that shows a budget breakdown um, for the Farm Bill. And a uh, big, big other picture related to that is that during the pandemic, um, the Inflation Reduction Act or the IRA made unprecedented uh, levels of funding available for conservation programs, specifically the EQIP program and the conservation easement program. Um, and so when the reauthorization process started for the farm bill, um, it's a really interesting dynamic right now because there was so much federal investment into different programs during the pandemic. And so now that the budget negotiations related to the debt ceiling are happening right now, um, one of the uh, sort of directives of the House under Republican leadership with, with Speaker McCarthy is to take back some of that money that was made available through the Inflation Reduction Act, specifically for conservation programs. I think conservation programs are Title III in the Farm Bill. And so USDA, um, in, in, in partnership with, with state agencies, are really rushing to get money out to states and to eligible groups, especially for those programs that receive that bump of funds from the Inflation Reduction Act. If it's not spent, that money will likely be recouped by Congress. Um, and uh, that might happen, that might happen, we'll see. Um, but yes, the debt ceiling negotiations are definitely running in tandem with the farm bill and also coming into an election year as well. So it's kind of this weird confluence of a lot of things happening, but um, yeah, those are all things happening in, in real time. <laughs> 